We're going to talk today a little bit about talent management. Earlier in this webinar series, we have talked a lot about leadership and management. And I think for me, one of the most important parts of success as it pertains to ASOs and CBOs throughout the country is to make sure that all of the components that can build to an organization's success are included. And in my opinion, none is as important as understanding the role that good talent plays when it comes to building success for that organization. One of the things we're going to be talking about today is exactly what, what does talent management mean and why is it so critical uh, in order to enable a, an organization to meet its particular goals. We'll talk a little bit about some of the skills and competencies that are included in understanding and supporting good talent. We'll talk about the role of employee engagement and how to make sure that we as an organization are doing everything possible and plausible to retain our top staff. And we'll talk a little bit about the role of coaching and mentorship and how it can help us uh, in developing future talent. This, is, this quote, what distinguishes great from good, winners from losers, and adaptation from extinction, is a great question that has been asked by many gurus of leadership development. And one of the best answers that I've been able to find in my own personal career is this quote from Indra Nui, who happens to be the CEO of one of the largest corporations in the world, namely Pepsi. And what Indra says is that having the right team playing on the field is basically the difference between victory and defeat or from success and failure. Now, we know for an organization to succeed, to actually meet what it intended to meet in terms of its goals, the first thing that that organization may need is a strong vision and a mission that can be understood by everyone. That's sort of the what when we talk about um, the purpose of, of an organization. We also know that another thing that an organization needs are the managers and the leaders that provide the motivation and the reason why uh, we want to continue to keep our focus and our attention on those, uh, that vision and on those particular goals. But finally, we also need employees. We need those people who are skilled and who are committed to our goals in order for us to succeed. And those employees, regardless of what position they hold within the organization, is actually the how, the crux the most important piece as to whether or not we will or will not be successful. So let's talk a little bit about talent management and what we actually mean by that phrase. Talent management is a willful development of a differentiated organizational structure. For those of you who ever follow big business and read what happens on the stock market or with Fortune 500 companies, you may find that a lot of attention, most of the attention, in fact, is often focused on the very top of the structure of an organization. Well, I think that is simply because uh, a, a better way to control the, the process that that particular organization is making. But it is not the organizational structure at the very top that is the only component of really good talent management. It is that organization's ability to differentiate the many different roles that all of the levels of staff and employees within that organization play 
and that they are orchestrated in such a way that they work collaboratively and in tune with each other. Talent management also includes our ability and our interest in actually finding, obtaining, and retaining a pool of individuals that have both the highest level of potential to become the leaders of tomorrow and those individuals who are so good at their job, whatever their specific role is, that they are able to keep others focused on that job and to actually achieve the outcomes that are expected of their individual position. It's important that an organization understand that it is precisely the practices and protocols that they follow in hiring staff that can be one of the most fundamental components of success or failure. Another aspect of talent management is whether or not we take the time as a viable organization to actually help our staff plan their careers. It is important for us as a successful organization to develop programs that will help sustain the interests of people who do have high potential and who can become high performing individuals so that their personal goals are met and that we learn how to learn from them in order to share some of their secrets and some of the steps that they take in order to uh, increase their level of competency. And finally, talent management also includes our willingness to actually invest in systems and in mechanisms that will greatly improve or ensure the commitment of our staff. When we did a survey here at ARCW, we do one every two to three years to find out whether or not uh, what we are focused on is in response to what our staff thinks is important for them. And what we have found is that the three highest components for job satisfaction and employee commitment really doesn't change all that much. Those things are salary and benefits, of course. In other words, what's in it for me? Another thing is the ability to advance not so much into a higher level position, but to develop my own skill set, which I may possess inherently or which appeals to me and to my personality. But on top, and this is a result that has repeated itself several times over, is the interest in our staff to be recognized for the skill sets that they bring to the job. In other words, they may have to learn the very specifics of a particular role, but what they bring is a skill set that can be transferable and that can be put to great use by the department or the location or discipline in which they are working. Now, there was back in 2014, about two and a half years ago, a survey that was done by uh, uh, a consortium of corporations who study the psychology of, em of employment. And they were particularly interested through this survey to garner some data, some information they surveyed middle and top management of approximately 2,000 corporations and non-for-profit organizations within the United States. And I wanted to share some of the data with you. About 60% of middle managers in these 2,000 plus organizations 
say that as far as they know, there is absolutely no plan that has been shared with them or that has been made public to all of the workers of their company or their organization that speaks specifically to a succession. In other words, when my immediate boss or when a divisional manager or when a department director retires or moves on into a different discipline, I don't know how that role continues into the future. There is no public plan that I am aware of. 60%, that's a very high number. Another data tidbit that I found very interesting is that 20% of the senior executives, in other words, those individuals at the very top of the corporation, company, or organization, say that they believe they actually have a very comprehensive and a very strong strategy in order to continue to promote or to hire or to be successful in any succession plan. When I first read these data, I was very struck by the apparent disconnect between what people at the very top believe they have shared successfully with their employees and what their middle management. And that, uh, for, for those of us who work in community-based organizations or aid service organizations, that would mean our line supervisors, our associate directors, and our directors. There seems to be a strong, strong disconnect. And the third tidbit of data is that less than 1% of executive directors or chief executive officers, presidents, of corporations or organizations feel that their plans for acquiring and retaining talent is absolutely aligned with their business planning cycle. Less than 1%, even though 20% say that they have a comprehensive strategy. So that got me thinking that, well, if we're going to believe what the leadership and psychologists of social construction tell us, then we're going to have to change the way we look at talent management in order for our organization to remain successful. And some of the high points of successful organizations, some of those characteristics or traits have been identified almost universally. What the people who study these types of organizations tell us is that organizations that are clearly successful can be identified very quickly by the values that they espouse and by the culture that drives them within their organization itself. They are companies and corporations that have the, the ability to move very, very quickly across many business models so that adaptability and responsiveness to external forces is a talent that they, are, they can manipulate very well. They have a good blend of leadership, of management, and of technical know-how. And they are constantly able to move through changing environments and conditions, even when those conditions have their source on the inside rather than out the outside. So let's talk a little bit about how we attract talent. And these are questions that I would encourage you to uh, ask uh, of each other when you return to your own per, uh, individual organizations so that you can begin to look at your process and your protocols when it comes to attracting talent within your CBO. So we know that if we're, if we're talking about HIV or AIDS, for example, we know that in the past, one of the biggest attractions 
to our organization of people who were interested in addressing the issues of HIV and AIDS was a very personal connection to the disease. Those of us who have worked in this industry know that 30, 35 years ago, uh, HIV was a fairly unknown entity, but we all had personal experience because we lost a brother or a sister or a friend or a neighbor, or because we were very interested in what was happening, even though we had no direct explanation exactly to the why and wherefore of this terrible virus. The things that attract talent today are very different from those of us who have been in this fight from the very get-go. Thanks to the progress that has been made on the health medical side of things, people with HIV today are able to live very, very healthy lives. So the exact item that may attract talent today is very different possibly, from that which we could depend on 30 years ago. So what is it about our unique organization that provides some value to people who may want to think about joining us? How do we build the relationship that we need? How do we create those networks that not just that connect us not just to people who do the very same kind of work that we do, but that connect us to individuals, organizations, businesses, corporations, companies that attract individuals who have those transferable skills that would benefit ASOs and CBOs today. And how do we encourage these individuals who may be in different disciplines to consider working in an environment like an HIV ASO or a community-based organization that wants to support the efforts uh, when dealing with a social issue or a chronic disease. In other words, how do we create the pipeline so that we know we have a pool of ready candidates who may be available to us before the need is actually present. One of the ways we can do this is by branding or by making sure that we are identified by our organization's culture. And we cannot be identified as having a particular culture if we do not know and have not been able to clearly state what our values are. Our values basically are the ideals, those, those uh, concepts that we stand for. They are the principles that along with our stated goal, our mission, make us different from any other kind of organization. And so it's imperative that when we talk about talent management, we have to make sure that we are doing everything we can inside our organization to make, to enable the people we are working with, whether they are our leaders, our managers, or our line staff, to identify those values that propel us to do the work that we do. Let's talk a little bit about making the right hires. In my experience, and I have worked in both the corporate world, huge corporations that employ over 300,000 staff, or in small nonprofit organizations that uh, enable every member of that organization to individually and personally know every other employee. In my experience, very many times we tend not to think about exactly the job that we have available 
that could attract talent. We usually don't think about it until such time as the individual who was performing that particular role leaves for one reason or another. It may be to start a family or to return to school, or perhaps there was another professional opportunity that came along that made that individual quit his or her post with us. So what happens very typically is that we pull out and dust off the very same job description, assuming we even have one. Uh, and we look at that job description maybe, maybe just uh, by glancing at it, making sure that the supervisor's name or the location name hasn't changed. But we really don't do a thorough job of identifying specifically what is it? What is the outcome and what is the product that we need in order to successfully fill this role? And so I encourage you to spend a lot of time with deep and considerate thought in developing your job description. That job description must be current. It must identify the need not as it existed when that job description was first written back in 2002, but the job as uh, it is required today. Another thing that you have to be very certain of when you're looking to hire people is that you identify the skills that your potential hires have in order to do, to accomplish the responsibilities that you have very clearly listed. You also need to identify exactly what the deliverables are. What is the product that you must have in order to consider it as having been accomplished? In addition to specific skills, you should be looking at personality characteristics and traits those are the professional competencies that can be brought by a potential hire into your organization to make sure that not only is the skill there, but those softer traits such as um, a level of energy, um, a, an interest in creativity and innovation, those are skills regardless of the specific job that an individual is doing that can transfer from one specific goal to another. And finally, you need to make sure that your in incentives, your compensation package, your training and development opportunities make sense to the people that you are trying to get on board today. Some of those talent competencies that I had mentioned just a few minutes ago are, uh, are these three, at least these three. Does the person that you're trying to hire have drive? In other words, is this person committed not only to completing his or her responsibilities, but are, is this person's um, approach to his or her job of such a nature to encourage other people to go the extra mile? Does this person have the ability to uh, utilize good judgment? Can they make a decision that is based on data? Can they make a decision that is a, a solution to a problem that exists today? And remember that leadership is not something that happens only at the top executive le le uh, level. You want leaders within every single department. You want leaders at every single stratum or level, regardless of what that job is. Many, many years ago, when I was engaged in organizational development at a very large insurance corporation, we decided to look at our, uh, our development of staff 
in a new way. And one of the first things that we had done was instead of looking at key components of skills, of attributes, and of uh, competencies at the top or at a director or supervisor level, we actually started with the mailroom. And what we found was that leadership was just as important in the mailroom as it was in the boardroom. And it was from the experiences through that exercise that we were actually able to help people who were doubtful uh, that leadership is something that is attainable and highly possible at every single level of that very large corporate uh, uh, organization. Remember that the trick to leadership and to good management is to get the work done by everybody rolling up their sleeves. And that means being able to motivate others to get in line and help push that ship forward. This slide is a graphic that helps us understand that we have many people within our organization to bring to it varying levels of skills and competencies, and that all of those various levels are useful to us, and all of them are equally important. If you look across the x-axis, that's the one that runs from left to right, this particular chart indicates that performance builds as you move further to the right. And along the y-axis, that is what we refer to the growth in potential. There are employees and staff and volunteers in your respective organizations who may have low potential and may not be performing at the top of your list. And yet, they bring to your organization something of value. And it is up to you as members of that organization to think of ways in which potential can increase and performance can improve. Now, please also remember that not everybody can nor should be looked at as uh, the person who must continuously and immediately keep climbing that ladder to success. We will always need workers who are very happy at and good at doing their job. So I don't want to leave you with the impression that everybody is hired today and within 12 months is expecting or should be considered tomorrow's leader. However, our ability to identify those whose potential is the greatest and whose performance continues to grow and to tap them for the possibility of further development for leadership. Remember I had mentioned transferable skills several times a little bit earlier today. Those staff, those employees who we should be identifying as potential key staff within our organizations are those that possess skills that are both transferable and values that are identified as professional. Some of those trans transferable skills can be an ability to solve problems an ability to work within a team environment instead of only as an individual. Individuals who are unafraid to be creative and innovative. Professional values are those uh, values that help us improve our efficiency. They exude a level of confidence and can do. They bring with them a certain effort call determination that allows them to say, yes, I can, before they even start trying. Some other professional values include the ability to motivate both themselves and others and to not be afraid of failure. On top of this slide, 
is, and this is a joke that I hope you enjoy as much as I do, being a member of a human resources department, I very frequently am engaged in reviewing resumes. And so this particular comic helps us understand that if we see a resume that gloats about being president of a senior class for three years or more, that may be a clue that perhaps we should pass on that particular potential candidate. Another very important component when we're looking at managing and hiring talent is the whole of, um, concept of manageability. Remember that the type of employee that we want to attract is an employee who is not a loose cannon, but an individual who has enough maturity to be able to work with others on a purely professional basis, and one who is able to take direction and not set himself or herself up with the belief that it is only their way or the highway. The, the skill or the talent of manageability is especially important when you are considering hiring people into management or leadership positions. So let's take a look uh, a little bit at organizations that actually have spent some time looking at talent and making a commitment to good talent management. These organizations that are talent savvy are organizations that are not afraid to cultivate perspectives of various views. They are organizations who are very willing to listen to the opinions of people at various levels, of people with differing cultural experiences, and to ask questions and then listen to responses as to how these staff have experienced the workplace. Savvy organizations are, are not afraid to share information. There was a time in corporate America where the phrase information or knowledge is power was quite pervasive. And that led to adverse uh, reactions within those corporations because these types of corporations who believe that information or knowledge belongs only to a very few number of people, usually at the very top, these organizations were unable to empower their employees or their staff. Conversely, talent-savvy organizations share information. They set up systems of communication that are frequent and repetitive so that all employees, all volunteers, all individuals that are interested in the mission of that organization know exactly where they are going, what progress has been made, and what some of the gaps still are. Savvy organizations embrace creativity. They know that at times we must allow risk takers to take those risks and to even fail because it is through failure that we can learn our best and our most important lessons. Savvy organizations engage their employees. We'll talk a little bit more about engagement in just a moment. But they work transparently. They're not afraid to let their employees and their staff know exactly what is expected at each level. They have a continuum of progress that is readily identifiable by all individuals. And they are organizations that are committed to developing talent and understand that this type of development is not a one-time training and then you're done, but instead is a program that continues for many, many years. It would be remiss of me to paint a picture for you 
uh, that would lead you to believe that talent management is a very easy sort of thing. It's not. And there are basically two problems that appear to be common problems, regardless of the environment in which one works, corporate or not-for-profit, huge or very small. One of those problems is that the organization seems to work within silos, especially silos that pertain to the hiring or the talent acquisition process. What do I mean by that? Well, in order for talent acquisition to work well, there has to be collaboration among various areas of that organization. Talent acquisition cannot just simply be the proponent of the human resources manager department or even the one human resources coordinator that you may have in place. It is a collaborative effort that involves the director or the supervisor or the hiring manager within a particular department. It involves executive management because you have to have a very clear-cut idea of specifically what role is missing, what is the gap that needs to be filled in order for that organization to be better prepared to begin to meet its goals more efficiently and effectively. And, of course, it has to involve the human resources or the recruitment staff. If you do not have such a collaborative work environment, I strongly urge you to begin to build one. And the easiest way to do so is to bring together individuals representative of at least these three uh, separate entities to start the conversation going. Another common problem in talent management has to do with line supervisors, sometimes called middle managers. The survey that I had mentioned at the onset of this presentation also included a lot of data as to the problems that can be caused by supervisors or middle managers who actually act as a deterrent to the development of other staff. Why? Well, these supervisors, some of them, are very, very happy in the position that they possess. They don't want to go anywhere. They do not have any aspirations for, for moving on to bigger and better or different things. But they also don't move out of the way. And their reluctance to move out of the way sometimes can enable them to become afraid of or wary of talent that they may see in line staff that may be reporting to them. And so what can happen a lot is that the talented line staff person who has a lot to offer, who may need a leg up, who may need a little guidance or direction, literally feels trapped. They can't go to their manager or to their supervisor because that person is not interested in promoting somebody else and they feel stunted because they do not have the opportunity to develop skills that they are interested in developing. And unfortunately, many people who find themselves in this sort of quagmire end up leaving the organization and that is a tremendous loss of potential talent. So be aware of this in your own unique settings. Let's talk a little bit about disengaged employees. I know we've all heard the term of engaged employees, but what does that really mean? Well, engagement to me means employees who are interested in the work that their organization is about. They are interested in how they can improve or better their competencies so that they work at the top of their job description, not at the bottom of it. Disengaged employees who simply come to work because they are there 
only to collect a paycheck can cost an organization of a little bit over $8,000 of lost income, revenue, or monies that can be put to better use. And that's not over the lifetime of that employee. That is on an annual basis. Think about that. That is a tremendous loss of, of, of resource that can be put to much better use. So we really need to spend a little bit of time talking about engaging the employees. We've set out to hire people with good skill sets, with professional competencies, and now we need to make sure that these fine hires that have been made, that we don't just give up and uh, uh, feel that we have come to the end of uh, our responsibilities, no. We need now to make sure that we have retention plans and that we are able to motivate these employees in such a way that the talent they bring to our organization can be sustained well into the future. So ask yourself these questions. How has my organization and has my organization set out to identify those indicators that we believe will be of best use to us. What type of indicators do we need to make sure that we help ourselves look towards the future? And how do we then begin to build individuals who can help us achieve these indicators? How do we develop programs that can sustain and nurture these individuals. If we are unable to classify staff that have the potential to be high performers, to be our good leaders, to be our decision makers three, five, seven, or ten years from now, what are we able to identify? How do we know where our strengths lie? And if we don't know where our strengths are, how do we go about beginning to identify the gaps that we must uh, challenge ourselves to fill? Another area of attracting and managing talent is through our work with volunteers, especially those of us who are involved in nonprofit work know that our ability to hire more and more staff is dictated in great part by our success in being able to achieve our goals while being very mindful of using our resources in the best manner possible. And so we frequently have to turn to volunteers. Now, the great thing about using volunteers throughout our, uh, our organization is that we attract volunteers from the broader, the wider community. And those volunteers live uh, in that community. So they can take the experiences that they have gleaned by performing some tasks or duty within our organization back to the broader community. And they can actually help build our brand. I've listed for you two organizations, these are government fed organizations, that can help you identify, find, train, and use volunteers. One, of course, is through the government, SAMHSA grants, and the other is a wonderful organization called Volunteer Match. They actually work with a consortium of nonprofits that can help you find um, engaging and uh, very interested and committed volunteers. I urge you uh, to uh, reach out to both of these organizations to help you in your quest for good volunteers. Let's just spend a little bit of time talking about retaining the good staff that we've been able to hire. So let's make sure that the staff once hired are actually committed to the goals that brought them in through the front door in the first place. 
Are we treating our employees fairly? Are we recognizing our employees for the work that they are doing? Are we valuing every commitment and every contribution made at every single level of employee? Do we offer incentives that reinforce exactly the types of behaviors and performance that we expect from our staff? And when I say recognize and incentives, I hope that everyone understands that while monetary, financial, or tangible incentives certainly do work, by no means are they the best kind of incentives. The sheer fact of being able to develop a process or have a system established in your organization that will recognize people not just within their own department for the work they have done, but they will be recognized throughout the entire organization. Think about the last time, you, those of you who may be in a supervisory role, how many times have you elevated the recognition of some small uh, performance behavior that you may have noted within your respective department to a director in a totally different department? What I'm really talking about is how easy is it for you to brag about your employees it does wonders to the morale and the esteem, not only of the individual that you are elevating through recognition, but it also helps build a culture of recognition and empowers people in other departments to do the same. One good way to uh, talk about employee retention and to talk about recognition and honoring the good work that people do is to help create systems that create and support the values we have identified because it is these values that promote the culture. And you know, it, it isn't, it doesn't take long to begin to understand how pervasive the culture in your respective organization is. Uh, culture is something that is quite palpable. And the easiest way to prove this to yourself is go to a staff person that you may have hired within the last two to three months and ask them how things are for them. Ask them what their experience in their onboarding process has been like. And you will find that very quickly uh, they will be able to identify exactly how things work within your organization. Uh, please remember that the word empowering means many different things to many different people. And very often we may have had an experience where we hire an individual that we feel is going to be of great promise to us. And a few weeks or months down the line, we're sort of scratching our heads wondering, boy, what happened to all that promise that we saw at the time of recruitment? Well, folks, nine times out of 10, if there's been a promise that has remained unfulfilled, it's probably our fault. In other words, it's probably the fault of the manager or the supervisor who has not um, instilled in that individual, not taught that individual, the components of success by which they will be measured. If we don't let our newly hired staff be aware of their critical and most important responsibilities, and if we do not keep their, the expected products or deliverables directly in front of them every step of the way, then we are failing them. We must be able to champion accountability we must be able to recognize their successes when they reach our particular benchmark, and we must be willing to redirect them uh, when they are going down the wrong path or when they are not working up to the potential that we see in them. And this has to be an ongoing 
repetitive basis. This is not a fast 35 second conversation in the hallway uh, because that type of conversation will not hit its mark. This next graphic, excuse me, um, this, this next graphic very quickly enables us to see exactly how uh, setting forth a performance model that helps our staff be successful works. So we identify their uh, level of skill and knowledge. We know exactly what they are individually capable for. We outline very clearly our expectations and the outcomes of their, of their tasks. We direct by providing guidance and support. We give them feedback. We recognize and we reward them for doing the right things the right way the first time. And then we rinse and repeat and do this over and over and over again. Very quickly as a recap, um, let, let's just review what we've talked about. We've talked about building a brand that identifies your organization uh, that is easily identified throughout an entire network of collaborations and partnerships that you have throughout your entire community. You have to make sure that you know exactly the type of individual that you're looking for because the skill set and the potential that individual brings is directly lined up with the strategy that you have developed for your organization. You, you have a willingness and a commitment to provide opportunities for training uh, by which you can share with your new staff uh, and help them develop or further develop the skills that they need to succeed. You will coach them uh, coaching is a wonderful, wonderful habit that I would encourage you all to look uh, for opportunities to offer your staff. Coaching does not have to be done only by the immediate supervisor. Find staff, regardless of their position, who are very good at what they do and connect that coach with a potential new employee to teach them exactly those skills and their know-how uh, that can be transferred into um, your specific department. Make sure that you're willing to spend equal time on both the hard technical skills and the softer skills that all of us need in order to be successful. And provide your staff opportunities for growth by assigning them to product, projects that are of special interest to them, or having them learn about uh, disciplines that may be in a department removed from the one that you are in. I can, um, I can assure you that without a firm investment and commitment to talent management, you are going to probably be faced with the problems that so many organizations have been faced with in the past. We know that change is the one thing that is guaranteed us. We know that if we don't learn how to make better hires or learn how to keep our turnover rate at its lowest point, learn how to engage employees and learn to help our employees adapt to the constant challenges we're going to be spending a lot of effort and a lot of resources and a lot of dollars continuously rehiring, retraining, uh, only to lose really good people again. 